anointed that word to us tonight. Are there any spoken requests we need to mention, Brother Don? Yeah, traveling verses for the Australians going back and forth. Yes. Okay. Sister Hoot. Sister Hoot. Okay. Certainly remember her. Sister Lois. Traveling mercies for Wesley while he's on this trip. And also, Joe's planning a high mountain sheep hunt. And my back is drinking again. Okay. Certainly do that. All unspoken requests. Love with you. I'm going to ask Brother John if you would please lead us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, just thank you, Lord, for being able to come here tonight, Lord, and yes. bring this request before you, God. And just ask you for you, God. Traveling mercies of Brother David and Sister Sarah, Lord. Yes. And for um, Brother Wesley, just asking you keep them in on your hand, God, and on Joseph's attack them, Lord. And we also ask him for uh, Sister Alina, God, and just to heal you know, her, Lord, whatever the ailment she may have right now, Lord. Just ask him to heal her, God. And we also ask you for all the unspoken requests, God, that are upon everybody's hearts. And ask you to be with Brother Brian and and wisdom and uh, strength and knowledge and discernment, Lord, for what you have happened to you, God. And we ask you all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Sing one more familiar chorus, Spirit of the Living God. <laughs>
are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the perusia of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This power is in prayer. The gracious Father, we approach thee reverently tonight, Lord, knowing that your word is truth. It is the only truth. Let all men's words be alive, and yours be true, saith the Lord. And Father, we just pray, Lord, that you would hold to your word as your prophet said, say what's on the tape, and only what's on the tape. And help us, Father, as we continue to study in this Christ is the mystery of God revealed in, in this mini series on the chronology of the end time events, looking tonight at the voice, which is the resurrection. So, Father, we just pray that you would help us to step aside from our own thinking. May only your thoughts, thus saith the Lord, be given. For it is your word, and through the word through the vindicated prophet, that's all we care about. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You can open also your Bibles uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to do a little study here because this all has to do with the time of the resurrection. And notice we're looking at the events of the resurrection. And on uh, Sunday, we preached on the bride events, and uh, which one of those events is the resurrection itself. Then uh, next Sunday, we're actually going to get into the, at the same time that the, the bride events are taking place, there's also the world events taking place, and we're going to look at those as well. But here we find in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you do stand. By which also you are saved, if, now that's, that's a big if, if you keep in memory that which I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So he's warning us there. He says, look, there's people that are going to hear, they're going to listen to what I'm preaching, but it's going to be in vain. Now the last statement that he says, is, you know, is uh, that there will be some who actually come to the place where their belief is in vain. And we know what Jesus said in Mark 7, 7, how be it in vain did they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. And we know the word in vain means simply it's of no effect. There's no effect at all. So he tells us the gospel, the good news, which he says, I preached unto you will be for your salvation, if you keep it in memory, what I preached unto you. That is, unless you believed in vain. Now to believe in vain means that your belief or faith took no effect upon you. It made no changes in you. So, you know, if you come to church, you pay your tithes, you, you, you show up, you know, you do all these things, but there's no change in your life, that's still in vain. I'm sorry, but the Word of God has got to change you, because if there's going to be, if you're going to be part of the resurrection, you've got to be resurrected right now. You've got to be resurrected in heavenly places, sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. You can't wait till someday and say, well, I'm going to get ready that it's, it's too late. In the, the Message Bible translation puts it this way. Friends, let me go over the message with you one final time. This message that I proclaim and that you make your own, this message on which you took your stand and by which your life has been saved, I'm assuming now that your belief was the real thing and not a passing fancy and that you're in this for good and you're holding fast. That's what this message is about. We find Jesus speak this, uh, of, of these kind of believers in Luke 8. And verse 13 says, They on the rock are those people which when they hear, they, they receive the word with joy. But these are those who have no root in themselves, so they do believe for a short while. But when the, the time of testing comes, they are the ones who will fall away. So they're believers falling away. Just like Brother S says, Satan is a believer. He believes and he trembles. So we see the gospel, which is the good news, the message, is sown to many. And many at first believe, but when trials come because of the word, those without any roots will fall, they'll fall away. They lose sight of what the message is all about, and they cave into the pressures of the trial, and they lose it all. They get tested, and then because of the test, oh, I can't take it anymore. And boom. In Luke 8, 14, but that word which was sown among you, 
uh, uh, excuse me, that was sown among the thorns are those persons which, when they have heard the word, they go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and they bring no fruit to perfection. In other words, they believe in vain. So you got those who, by the wayside, believe in vain. Those who are amongst the thorns, believe in vain. So you're going to have more people receive the, the message in vain than you're going to have people who show fruits being for repentance. Again, we see that there's a group, another group, all together, who hear the same word, the same good news, the same message, but their focus is not on the message, but rather on the cares of this life. And so God will allow the cares of this life to overcome them. And these are the persons who bring no fruit to perfection, which is maturity. They will sit in this message a lifetime. But because their focus is on things, and their focus is on materialism, they lose sight of the bigger picture, and never come to maturity in their fruit, in their life proves where they're at. Now that's one of the scariest because you can sit here and listen and rejoice, but unless you take it home and make it a part of who you are and allow the word to change your life, you can lose it all to things. And you can't take your things with you. Why did William Brown turn down a $1.5 million check? Because it simply meant nothing. In fact, I just read a quote today where he said, that the money of this world means nothing. He said, he said, I've been overseas, I've been to Africa, where their currency was these little shells that they get out of the rivers, and they've got these little curly, you know, curly like uh, things in them. He said, and that's their currency, but if they took that to Wall Street, the Wall Street Jews would just laugh. Say, get your rubbish out of here. And he said, and that's what God thinks of your currency. And yet people will, will compromise their walk with Jesus Christ for that green stuff that's not worth anything. It's time that we reconcile ourselves with the real picture and the big picture, which is there's we're in the midst of a rapture. The shout has already gone forth. Can you imagine if God were to come down in a big bus? It's being facetious here. A big bus. And he says, get on, the rapture's taking place, and you get on, and then you say, oh, wait a minute. He's not leaving for 45 minutes. I'm going to go out and have a good time. That's what people are doing today. He can hold the bus for me. He ain't going to hold the bus for you. Sorry. 1 Corinthians 15, continue. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. I like that, because he's not giving us anything of his own. It's only what God gave him. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of about five hundred brethren not all at once. Or at once. Of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due season. For I am the least of the apostles that, that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. <clears throat> Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so we believe. Now notice in these few verses we see that there was a period of time that Jesus was seen after his resurrection by various people over a period of time, somewhere between 40 to 50 days after his resurrection. Now you might say, well, where do you get that number from? You know, we hear Brother Vale, we hear Brother Branham, we hear uh, even Billy Graham use the, you know, use the, use the term that uh, Jesus' resurrection was about 40 days. And uh, so where do you get that from? Well, some say maybe 40 to 50 days. Well, you see, Jesus was crucified on the Passover the Passover week. And on the day of Pentecost, which is the Feast of Pentecost, it's 50 days later. So somewhere between that time and maybe minus a few days in the grave and the 50 days, or actually it was 10 days before Pentecost when he, when he, uh, when he ascended up then he came back at Pentecost. So we have a period of about 40 days and I'm going to show you in Scripture uh, just so you, you understand because we're, again, we're looking at events, we're looking at the timing, we're looking at this thing, this, look, there's, I know there's a lot of people who don't believe the tent, they don't believe there's going to be a ministry, 
when the resurrection takes place, they don't believe uh, in hardly anything. They, they, they kind of believe the Pentecostal way that you're going to be going down the road in a bus and all of a sudden the bus driver is going to be gone. And you're going to scream at the top of your voice, oh, 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 I missed the rapture. And that's hogwash. Jesus was seen, we just read it from Paul, 500 here, 2 here, 12 here, 1 over here, 1 over here. There was many, many people that saw him and he was there for about a 40-day ministry. And we all know the story of the Passover and hopefully we know what it means. For those who don't, it was the day that when Moses had commanded the people to make bread in haste with no time to leaven it. So leaven or yeast was, 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 uh, was not applied to the grain and the unleavened bread was cooked in a hurry and they were instructed to eat it after the angel of death passed over, thus Passover. That is where you get the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Passover meal. They were also instructed to slay an innocent lamb and place the blood on the doorpost and lintel of the door which represented the sign of the cross, which could signify uh, which one day Messiah would die. Now, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24, Paul says, By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the, than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So you remember the, the, the death angel was coming through the camp, or coming through in Egypt, and those who had the lamb, the blood of the lamb applied to the doorpost, the lintel of the doorpost, which you know signifies you know, up here or down here, which signifies the cross, you know. And uh, and as Brother Brandon so put it, that was their token then. And uh, in Mark 20, uh, 26 and verse 1, we read, And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all of these things, he said unto his disciples, You know that after two more days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man will be betrayed and crucified. So Jesus said at the time of Passover, he would be crucified. Why? Remember when he went into the water, and he said, Suffer it to be so. You know, when John, John said, Well, you know, I shouldn't be baptizing you, you know, uh, you should be baptized in me. And Jesus said, suffer to be so, for thus it, you know, it needs to, uh, we need to fulfill righteousness. In other words, the lamb has to be washed before he sacrificed. And so then Jesus is saying right here in Mark 26, he says, now you know that after two more days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man will be betrayed and he'll be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people under the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. And they said, but not on the feast day, lest there would be uproar among the people. And yet they did do it. They did it on the Sabbath. They broke the Sabbath. They whipped him on the Sabbath. They did all these things on the Sabbath, breaking their own laws in order to, to show their hatred and their vengeance against the word of God made flesh. Now notice that Jesus knew the day he would die on the cross. He said, you know that after two more days is the feast of the Passover and the Son of Man will be betrayed and crucified. And we also know that the conspirators got together to plan his death during that time as well, only they wanted to avoid the exact day of Passover, but Passover was celebrated for seven days or one week. In John 13, verse 1, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, so now we're getting down to the hour because he had just... He had just told them two days ago, it's coming on the Passover. Now, they were actually, the, 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 the bread that they broke, the unleavened bread that they broke, he was actually celebrating the Feast of Passover. That was that last supper. Then the Passover is done. Now it's time for the Paschal Lamb because they ate the bread, but they didn't eat the lamb. Now, he was going to be, to be killed, okay? <clears throat> so we, we, we read here, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And Luke 22, verse 7, Then came the day of the unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. Now you don't kill unleavened bread. So what's the Passover? It's the, it's the Paschal Lamb, you see. And so it says, the day came for the unleavened, uh, uh, the, then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. 
Notice the Passover must be killed is a Paschal lamb. You don't kill the loaf of bread. And notice that God timed the death of his son, the Lamb of God, with the feast of Passover, pronounced Pasha, when God saved Israel from the angel of death that swept uh, through Egypt. In 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7b, the last half of the verse, it says, For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So Christ is the Passover. And but, but in getting back to 1 Corinthians, we notice that Paul listed a whole bunch of believers here. And he says, He was seen of Cephas, that's Simon Peter, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present time, but some of them are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James and all the apostles. And we find others in Scripture also where Jesus met after his resurrection. He met Mary at the grave. He met John and Peter. He met uh, 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 Cleopas, and I don't know who the other one was, uh, on the road to Emmaus. And, and then uh, he met several others. So all, all of these appearances took place in a humanly form for about a 40-day period or approximately six weeks. And we know Brother Branham said, when I get my tent, I'd like to take six weeks and go between the lines. Then a couple of decades later, he appears to Paul in the form of the pillar of fire while Paul was on the road to Damascus. Then after Paul lays out that background of all those witnesses, he goes on to say, now if Christ be preached and he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection from the dead? Now we've got 500 here, we've got 12 here, we've got one here, one here, one here, one here. That all these people that saw Jesus raised from the dead for 40 days, not just, uh, you know, like, like an instant so they didn't know if it was a ghost or a human being. They even put their hands in his flesh. You know, didn't, didn't uh, Thomas say, you know, uh, well, you know, I mean, didn't Jesus say, the ghosts don't have flesh, feel it, feel it? Come on, put your finger right here, unbeliever. <clears throat> Yet we have all these people saying, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Don't we have the same skeptical spirit today in this message? <clears throat> Those mockers who would question everything that took place in this hour because it was not reported in Google or some modern worldly communication module. But Paul goes on to say, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if there be no Malachi 4, like some are saying, then we are a most miserable people because, number one, we haven't got a clue what's coming up. If that wasn't Malachi, who is? Show me who was. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also in vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. And you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fall asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. So we can see the del deleterious effect of such a profession that would have on believers. But now he says, but now is Christ risen from the dead? Don't believe those guys because it's fact. We've got witnesses. And become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead, or out from the dead. For in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Notice, but since Christ has risen from the dead, he says, now let me tell you all about it. In verse 23, he says, but let every man, but every man in his own order. Christ the first fruit, that's, that's the first one. Afterwards, they that are Christ at his cruising. Notice Paul is speaking of an order to the resurrection. And just like God, there must be an order to all things because God, that God is involved with because that's the very nature. So we see here the first half of the first resurrection is when Christ raised up, uh, raised up the saints, uh, with, which raised up with him, and then he mentions the second half of the first resurrection when he says, "And they that are Christ at his perusing." Now I could take and show you quotes, and I think I already read some to you earlier in the study where Brother Branham said uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that uh, Abraham and Sarah were actually seen in the city of many, and there's actually that uh, scripture. <coughs> And uh, I don't remember if it was in John or the last chapter of, I think it was uh, Mark, uh, Matthew 27, <clears throat> where they were seen of many. All right, so this, we have the, uh, the saints that were, um, what's, the, what's the old scripture says, uh, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto many. And when he, he ascended up on high, 
and uh, Brother Brent talks about how we all went with him. So we have the first half of the, of, of the first resurrection already taking place. Christ is the first fruit. Then he says, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. So we see the first half of the first resurrection is when Christ raised up from the dead. He raised up with the saints. They raised up with him. Then watch the order, the first resurrection of, no, notice verse 24. Then cometh the end, after, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Listen, that was done on the cross. But notice, he says, after the Perusia resurrection, then he will have put all. Then God will have put all things under His feet. What? When you and I cannot no longer die, we go into resurrection. We go into rapture. You see? Hallelujah. Then Paul tells us who's placing all things under the feet of Jesus. Verse twenty-seven. And if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to get them out because I'd like you to make some changes. And they're not not changes, but actually uh, write down some some things that will help you understand this scripture better. Notice verse 27, for he, pencil in there, God, hath put all things under his, pencil in there, the Son of God's feet. But when he saith, all, all things are put under him, that's the Son of God, right there, the Son of God, it is manifest that he, God, right, right in there, God, is accepted, which <coughs> he put all things under him, the Son of God. All right, write that in there as well. Because there's too many he's and him's and, 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 and you don't understand who's he talking about. But if you understand the doctrine that God put all things under the feet of Jesus, then you're going to know which he is who. Alright. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, the Son of God, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, right in there, God, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now, let's skip ahead to verse 31. Paul says, I, I, I protest by your rejoicing that I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. Now, notice he gives evidence to his saying in Galatians 2 and 20 when he says he is crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He says, I am crucified with Christ. <coughs> Nevertheless, I, I am uh, I'm alive. Yet it's not I that lives, but Christ lives in me. Well, Brother Branham said, see, that was dying daily. Now, I've heard pe pe people preach over the years and say, well, no, you know, it, it was a once-for-all crucifixion. Well, then why is the Son of God crucified again? You know, Brother Branham never said that. And the Scripture says, and Paul says, I am, present tense, crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ live with me. Notice here, he says, I die daily. So it is a daily death that Paul is telling us about. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what, what advantage is it to me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. In other words, what good is all this life of sacrifice and giving and, and, and just living your life and yielding it to the Lord if the Lord doesn't really exist or if there really isn't a resurrection? Well, then it's just philosophy. And you might as well just eat, drink, and be merry. But the fact is that the reason why you know you're going to be in the resurrection is because you're already resurrected. You're already resurrected if Christ be in you. You have the resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. In other words, if there is no resurrection from the dead, then what is all this sacrifice all about? What a waste of life in martyrdom. He said, be not deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. In other words, evil companionship destroys moral habits. Awake, awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. And I speak this to your shame. Now, this next verse is where I want to get us tonight. He asks the question, but some men will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Then Paul goes on to give the answer to that very question. He says, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain, it may chance of wheat or some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men. 
and other flesh of beasts, and other of fishes, and other of birds. There are also celestial bodies, and also bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the, of the terrestrial is another. That's the opinion of values, all right? There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. He's talking values here, values of light. For one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in corruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Albeit that was not first, which was spiritual, but that which was natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, he's earthy, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, so are they also that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, <coughs> such are they also that are heavenly. In other words, if, if as Brother Branham said, what you are here is a reflection of where you're going. All right. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptibility, or this corruptible, shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. <clears throat> Now, getting back to this order of the resurrection. When Paul says every man in his own order, then he goes on to explain how that we have this earthly body that dies, is buried, like a seed buried in the ground. But just as a seed buried in the ground, it doesn't come up another seed. It produces a complete body full of seed life itself. And so then he compares the physical body to the spiritual body. And he says that we have, we have, both, we have both a spiritual body and a physical body. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Brother Ram said, What you are here, the natural body, is a reflection of that spiritual body. Now, in his message, Seven Church Ages, preached May 12, 1954, Brother Branham spoke about the order of the resurrection, and he said, Behold, he cometh with clouds. And he's quoting scripture. Now, let me stop here just for a moment. Clouds doesn't mean that he's coming on a big thunderhead. His mom, bless her heart, she's still sitting here some, somewhere. I remember her voice. She used to sit and tell me, said, He's coming on a great big cloud. He's going to race someday, and God's going to come on him. Now, the cloud that he's coming on, and coming is, if we just had the time to get this back and get the real background of the whole thing. Now the cloud he's coming in is not a cloud like a thunderhead, but it's a cloud of glory he's coming in. Well, what's glory? Again, it's the opinions, the values. He came down with a shout. That's your glory. Now when Jesus was overshadowed by, Mount, uh, by God in Mount Transfiguration, clouds overshadowed him and his raiment. See? And when Elijah would come down, a cloud come down and received him up, not a thunderhead, but a cloud of glory. His great glorious presence will strike the earth. He cometh in clouds. Oh, I love that. Clouds. There will be wave after wave of His glory will come across the earth, and the resurrection of the saints shall come. That blessed Holy Spirit that's lived in their hearts, and they, they've died with their corpse laying there, and the pierced veins over their cheeks and things like that, and they're placed back in the graveyard, and a great wave of that same Spirit, and shh, wave after wave, he that was last will be first. He that was first will be last. I kind of see it that way. That's the order of the resurrection. I won't know nobody in the generation before me or the generation after me. I'll know those in the generation with me. Every generation will come successfully right, uh, uh, right as it went down. 
They which are last will be first. Sure, that's me. See, I, I'll know my people. And the next time my dad and his people, my grandfather and his people, on down like that, wave after wave after wave after wave, and the saints will rise from everywhere. Won't that be wonderful? Amen. That makes the old people feel young again. So the order of the resurrection, God has an order, and it is, they which are first shall be last, and they which are last shall be first. So the first ones to come up will be this last generation that go down. This, I mean... Will be, yeah, will be the, the last generation to go down. Now, Paul also speaks of this order in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 20. He said, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. And notice that the use of the word first fruits shows there is an order to the resurrection, Christ first, then the rest. Verse 21, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. So there is an order to the resurrection, and each phase of the appearing has taken a certain period of time to accomplish. So, uh, so too shall the resurrection, it must take a period of time. And notice what that order of resurrection is. Christ the first fruit, afterward they are Christ at his fruit. Now we know there was, there was an order to the first resurrection, and as Paul taught, Jesus was the first fruit, and then the rest would come after he came. And if, and if I can get uh, any one point across in this study at this time, each phase of this end time appearing takes time. The shock has been going on for almost 50 years. In fact, it has been going on 50 years because 63 the, the seals were, were opened up. Do you realize it's, that uh, 50 years the seals, 50 years ago, 50 in, in 50 a, uh, 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 jubilee, jubilee. All right, 50 years ago we had a jubilee. You know what? It's time for another jubilee. Huh? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So we have four seasons in the year. Each season or each phase is marked by a certain event that takes place. And the resurrection is no different. In Matthew 27, 50, the Bible says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks did rent, and the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose, and there's a comma. And, which is a conjunction, came out of the grave after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Many of the saints which slept arose and had to wait for the first fruit to come up. Then they came up, and they appeared unto many. Notice that Jesus cried with a loud voice. The grave opened. The saints which slept arose. But notice that they did not come forth as resurrected beings until he came forth. So the order of the resurrection is very important. And look, what is the resurrection anyway? Isn't it a coming back to life? Isn't it a reawakening of the body that was asleep in death? And doesn't it have to do with life coming back into that body? And if that body was at one time active and then it fell asleep or went into such a deep sleep that it was constituted as dead, but a resurrection is a coming forth with the same life that it had before it died. And if you only go to the grave with your own natural life that you were born with, I'm sorry, but you, you won't have a resurrection this side of the millennium. You will, all things will be resurrected later on for judgment. That's why it's so important when he says, if the spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, lives in you, then it'll quicken your mortal body, not only the one that's in the grave, the one that you have now, because the one that raised the court, but that if, if you go to sleep with that spirit in you, you're going to raise with that spirit in you. You're not going to raise with your own nature again. Hallelujah. Amen. But the resurrection is coming forth with the same life that it had before. Not, not a human coming forth with a gorilla life or a cat life or a goat life or even human life. And not with someone else's life either, but their own life, their God life, the very God life that was in them before the foundations of the world that they were ordained to. As sons and daughters of God. That was ordained in God before the world was even framed. Coming back into that body again and raising it up. And there's only one life that will do that, and that is God's life in you. The life that we had in him before the foundation of the world. Now in, Jer uh, in Jehovah Jireh, Brother Brown said, and then remember, if we go before he comes, 
we will be up and in his presence or raised before the others are changed. You got that? Look for the resurrection before you have your change. He says, and remember, if we go before he comes, he will be up and in his presence. We will, uh, we will be up and in his presence or raised before the others are changed. The trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then, it means afterwards, we which are alive and remain shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and then be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Look at the order of the resurrection. See, God knows that we long to see our loved ones, and if we got there to meet him first, we'd be looking around to see if mother or dad or the rest of them was there. But see how the Holy Spirit in his wisdom, we meet one another first, and then we, go, we get there, and then we can sing Amazing Grace. That's when there's going to be a time of worship. You think I have funny now? Watch me up there. It's going to be a wonderful time for me and all of us when we get there. Hallelujah. Look at the grace of God. He's going to allow us who had loved ones that have already gone beyond the curtain of time to come back. Then we'll see them. When we see them, we get faith enough to receive a change ourselves. And we know who's made it. Then we go to meeting. And when we go to meeting, you talk about a time of worship. Because there's no more questioning, did mom make it? Did dad make it? Did his brother sister make it? Did so so make it? We know. So we get all that behind us. And now we go and we can really worship. From the Easter seal, in fact, uh, from Romans 10. <clears throat> Now, here's the thing I want you to understand. So far, we've looked at the mechanics, all right? That's the order and all of that. But now we must look at the dynamics because without the dynamics, the mechanics won't work. Romans 8 and 10 says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of right wiseness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of your body, you shall live. You see, when we look at those people, three groups of people that the Word was sown to, the first was, was sown on, on stony ground, there was no root. They died and withered. And they, they rejoiced because the Word, how can you not rejoice when you see people healed and all those things? <clears throat> then the other group, Brother Bell told me, he said that's the one Brother Rand told him, that he was, he was the most worried for uh, amongst the people because he said that's the one where the cares of this life chokes off the word and the word does not become fruitful in that person and they wither and they die. Then you have those who the word of God means so much to them that it has the full preeminence. Mm -hmm. You see, if, if the things of this world are your main attraction, you need to die. You need to die. You need to get like Brother Brown when they brought a million and a half dollar check it didn't, didn't matter to him. You need to be like Jesus. You know, he could have had the world if he wanted it. Had to borrow a boat to preach out of. Had to borrow a grave to be buried in. It's not about money. It's not about accumulating this side of the resurrection. I'm sorry. The early church, what do they do? They all, they all sold what they had. And they used what they had for the common good. Now, from Easter Seal, Brother Ransom, now, if that same spirit that was upon him to be that, that the Redeemer in that age that we have accepted. Now, the promise of in this last day is what will take place if you become part of that word, you are redeemed with him because the same spirit that dwelt in Christ is dwelling in you, quickening your life to this age. And it will also, in the end time, quicken your mortal bodies and resurrect them and bring them up. That takes the gloom away when we look at it that. And that's the truth. Romans here, Paul says... And proved it. If the spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, it will quicken, also quicken your mortal bodies. This is the same spirit that raised him up, that quickened the true believer to eternal life. The spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in the believer, quickens the believer to eternal life. Again, Ephesians 2 and 1, and you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. I want you to notice that Paul is speaking of people who have been quickened. They have already been made alive to God and his word and his plan for the hour. If that being the case, then you're witnessing the shout means you're going to witness the resurrection. You're participating in the shout means you're going to participate in the resurrection. You understand? 
Now, Ephesians 2 and 1 should read in the context of Ephesians 1, where Paul speaks of people who are elect and were in Christ before the foundation of the world and who have been predestined to the greatest plan and purpose of God, who wanted to have children. And these children would come in, in like fashion as his only begotten son came, uh, which is also in Romans 8, as we've read. Notice Paul speaks of this plan which calls for a quickening by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which, which Paul calls the earnest of our inheritance or the down payment. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2, or verse 1, Paul says, For we know that if our earthly tabernacle were dissolved, in other words, if we should happen to die, we have a building of God in a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That's where you go. For in this earthly body we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burned, not for that which we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. In other words, Paul saying, you know, the reason why we groan is because we're still stuck here in this flesh. We have limitations. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body than to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted by Him. In Ephesians 1.11 In whom we also have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him, who works all things after the counsel of His own will, that we should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom also, after you trusted, after you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that you believe, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of the glory. Now, a down payment that has been paid. We, we call it the earnest payment because it shows that we've made an earnest or a sincere commitment to honor the contract. God then has made an earnest down payment and he's placed it in your vault. And you know what that payment is? It's his life. You are safeguarding his life, and that life has taken over your vessel, and now it's that life, his life, which is your life. For Christ, who is our life, shall appear. There's no doubt of a resurrection, brother and sister. No doubt. No doubt. It's, it's on its way. It's already, it's already in, 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 in process. Hallelujah. Amen. Because we received a sincere pledge by God to finish the work which He began. Now the word quick and Paul used here in, in Ephesians 2 is a Greek word which means to restore again to life. It means to animate or rather to reanimate. That's why Brother Brown was saying the message treats your home. He said, you wasn't saved on that day. You was, you was always saved. Amen. Jesus just come to redeem that, but you were saved from the beginning because you had eternal life to begin with. In fact, the word redeem means to buy back, and how could it be redeemed or, or, or bought back if it wasn't owned by him to begin with? And how could your life and soul be redeemed if you didn't have to begin with? See, we are, uh, what we are here then is only a reflection of where we're going. I believe we're dealing with a dimensional principle that we know so little about, but Brother Bram said these very words in questions and answers. He said, what you are here, now get this in your mind now, I'm going to close, but what you are here is a sign that you are something else somewhere. You've always wanted to be in perfection, you Christians. There is a perfection, and that perfection is not in this life. But every man and woman here that is a Christian, every person that is a Christian here, now is already glorified in the presence of Jesus Christ. And you've got another body. You won't have some other time. You have right now. Right now, there's another body waiting for you if this one should perish. Could you think of that? Study that for just a moment. Hallelujah. So when somebody goes to the grave, why should people weep? That person's in immediately. If they're a believer... They're not like those souls in prison. 
from the entombment. He says our own life is just a pattern, it's just a shadow and not the real thing. It's a negative side. It takes death to develop the picture, to put us back in the theophany we come from. Then in the resurrection, we come in his likeness, a resurrected body. What a beautiful, not only beautiful, but it's real, solemn truth of God's eternal word that we'll be like him. And from Romans 8, 29, for whom he did already, that done deal, for, for whom he did foreknow, he also did, that's another done deal, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Moreover, whom he did, that's also a done deal, predestinate, then he also called, again, it's in past tense, it's a done deal. And whom he called, past tense, it's a done deal. Then he also justified, past tense, done deal. And whom he justified, past tense, done deal. Then he also glorified. So it's already done. We're just here to act out our part. Therefore, it's finished, it's done. You can't change the outcome no matter how hard you try. The problem is that you keep looking at this body and this death, this flesh. And that keeps you from really understanding who you really are and preventing you from the victory that's yours already in Christ Jesus who's already paid the debt. He's paid the price for your sin and mine. He cried, it's finished. 1 John 3 and 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Notice he said, now are we, not in the future, but already, now are we sons. And explaining healing and gyrus again, Brother Brown said, the devil's just trying to scare you out of something. He's trying to put something over on you somewhere. He says, you know, you say, some of these days you'll be this. You are now. Now we're sons of God. Now we're seated together in heavenly places. Now we have all powers in heaven and in earth. Now, see? Now we have it. Not in the millennium. We won't need it then. We got it now. We're right, right now we are the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that, that we'll be like Him. What, he, what you are here is a reflection of what you are somewhere else. Those who He called, He justifies. Is that right? Those who He justified, He has glorified. Already in the presence of the Father, we have a glorified body. Whew, wasn't that deep? All right. We'll find out whether it's right or not. If this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we have one already waiting. Is that right? That's right. So right now, what we are there is a reflection, or here, rather. What we are here is a reflection of what we are somewhere else. So if your deeds are evil, you know where it comes from. You know where your body's awaiting. That doesn't mean you don't make mistakes in this flesh. <clears throat> As Brother Vail brought out, where in John says, uh, He that is born of God does not sin. That word is, does not initiate sin. Even David, who said, Lord, take not thy spirit from me. David didn't go looking to find fault. He didn't go looking to, to, to commit adultery. David happened to be looking down, and he saw it. And when he saw it, he was weak in the flesh, and he fell. He didn't go looking for it. Now, God, rich in mercy. Brother Grant now, if you've got an eternal life tonight, if we have eternal life, uh, then we always were, because there's only one form of eternal life. We always were. And the reason we were, because we are a part of God. And God is the only thing that's eternal. And like Melchizedek, we see tithe from Abraham, and it was lauded to his great-grandson Levi, who was yet in the loins of Abraham, paid tithe, for, for, for he was yet in the loins of Abraham when he met Melchizedek. And I want to speak on that over at the other place one morning. Uh, who is this Melchizedek? Now notice that, way back, God knew this boy coming down. He knowed all things. Now, we are a part of God. You always was. You, you don't remember it because you were only an attribute in God. You were only in His thinking. Your very name, if it, if it ever was on the book of life, it was put there before the foundations of the world. Do you imagine that, Don? Don Shear. Before the foundations of the world. God had to make sure that your name was Don Shear, so He made sure your pappy and your mammy got together and gave you the looks that you had. And then He had to make sure your pappy's mother and father got together, and he had to make sure Pappy's great-grandfather and mama had to get together, and great your mother and her father, all the way back, all the way back, I talked to Brother Bell about this in 79, God will trace back your lineage and show how perfect it is, as he said, Brother Brandon said that the, that the, the, the physical birth is a much greater, much more complex thing than the virgin birth was. Because the virgin birth, God just put it all into an angel's bird, voila, there it's done. But with you, we had to make sure your parents met, then your parents' parents met, and your parents' parents' parents met all the way back to the garden to give you the exact chromosomes, DNA, the whole thing that you got to make you the way you are, make you look the way you do, your name, everything. Hallelujah. 
You talk about a God who's on the all. He's on the all, brother. Amen. He knows all things. So, we're still talking about the order of resurrection, but what I want us to see is that we are already, if we are already quickened, it's already in process. It's an event. Don't get bored like those kings down there in Oklahoma and go shooting people. That's exactly what their excuse was. I think it was Russian paper. But the fact is, too many people are getting bored in this life. They're, getting, they're doing things when they should be just getting on their knees. I've really been enjoying these series because it's caused me to have to come over here a lot more instead of just doing whatever. And I love it because God is unfolding and folding and folding, helping me to understand, helping you to understand. Yeah. It's time that we step into our roles and actually be who God calls us to be. Yeah. And God can have what we have. He said, them without us cannot be made perfect. So if we're still looking at the order of resurrection, <clears throat> and we are already quickened, we've already received a spiritual resurrection, which is the earnest of our body, and them without us cannot be made perfect. They've got to have what we've got. And that is this message of the revelation of Jesus Christ. So if they cannot be made perfect without us, first being made perfect and mature, then it lays in our laps. It lays in your laps. They without us cannot be per perfect. You've got to be perfect. You've got to be mature. You've got to just suck it up. Is that a bad word? Forgive me if I think that's a bad word. What I mean is you just got to do what you're supposed to do. Be sons. Laying in our laps. Now notice closely, for I come to you in a cloud, and every eye shall see him, no matter how far back they've died, they'll see him. Again in the message, images of Christ, Brother Brown speaks of the order of the resurrection. And, and he says, Now this is the order of the resurrection. We which are alive and remain shall not prevent them which are asleep, for the trumpet of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Meet one another before we meet him. Meet one another before we meet him. Says it twice. Be caught up together with him, with them to meet the Lord in the air, all together. We, he knew that if we got there first to worship him, and then we'll go to look around, wonder where baby is, wonder where mother is, and where is this one or that one. But you see, he lets us meet one another first, so then you go up to worship before the Lord on that day, and, and she'll be with you. See? I like it. Now it says, Cloud of glory has already come. Then how close are we? That was a cloud of glory. Can't call it anything else. He came down with a shout. The seals came forth. That is in glory. That is in the opinion of God. The judgment of God. The values of God. I don't know what it is. Then it's all in the works, brother and sister. From be not afraid, brother and sister, watch the order of the resurrection. The first thing we get together, not until we get together will we go to meet him. Mothers and fathers will meet one another. Children and loved ones will meet one another. And then be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But I get to meet your dad again. Hallelujah. Before we go. I get to meet your mother. Before we go. In testimony, the trumpet of God shall sound, the dead Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain. Did you notice the order of the resurrection? Shall be caught up together with them. We meet one another before he, we, meet, we meet him. Caught up together to meet him. To meet them, with them, to meet the Lord in the air. See, He's God, and what He and, and then when He wants to be worshipped, that's what His very nature is: is to be worshipped because He's God, and He knows if we were there and be looking out of the corner of your eye and see if the other one's there. But and then it wouldn't be the complete way of free worship. Then we stand there and we know that we met one another first and greeted one another, and then to stand by Him who calls it all and sing the songs of redemption as brother. Jack has many times made the statement when angels will circle the earth with bowed heads not knowing what we're talking about. See, because they've never been redeemed. But we had to be redeemed. And, not, and, 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 and how it will crown him the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Listen, I've got just a few more quotes, but these are really choice. Uh, we'll just have to take a little time to read them. From United Common Science, said, we find now uh, the time comes when the trumpet sounds and these sleeping saints back there that, that could not be made perfect without us. There's many of those Hebrew brothers. He's talking about Paul and Peter and all those Hebrew brothers that were, uh, because the other ones went up. 
And when they come together, they unite with the living ones. The church uniting with the word, then the church and the word uniting together, be, uh, becoming one. The dead saints with the living saints, uniting together to be one and all going together to unite with Christ yonder for the wedding supper of the Lamb. And the thing about standing, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, when the world won't know what's going on, but all of a sudden you'll see appear before you your loved ones that's gone on and has come to unite with you. And will be changed in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, and be caught up together to meet the Lord of the air. For Mother's Day, said, as that great light begins to spread all, <coughs> as we begin to look around in the great circle, will be getting greater and greater. It's all just reflecting the approaching of Jesus. Then as we see him, and will not be as we are now, we'll know how to love him more. We'll not stand back with a little fear because we'll, we'll be like him. He'll be more of a relative to us than he is now. Wow, he's your brother, and you'll recognize that. Look, it's taken the teaching for us to get to that point. You know, people used to think of God as a fearful thing, and they didn't understand Jesus at all. Now we understand God's a very merciful and loving Father, and he has an eldest son who gave himself for you and I. And when we see him, he said he'll be more of a relative to us than he is now. He said, we will not stand back with little fear, because we'll be like him. He'll be more of a relative to us than he is now. We'll understand him better because we're so far away in the mortal bodies. <clears throat> then we'll have a body like his own glorious body. We'll know how to worship him. And when we see what, that, what the presence of his being has done to us, it changes the old back young, all the deformed straightened out, oh, we'll understand then why his power healed us. We're, we're, we're coming into a wonderful... We should be focused on that. Sorry, all these careers and everything else... Forget them. I mean, you got to work, sure. Do it. But just get your focus on the, the big thing. Amen. Oh, my. From God in simplicity, God just speaks and the rapture will come. It ain't going out there and then the angels will come down with shovels and dig out the graves and get out the old dead carcasses. What is it? That's born of sin to begin with. But a new one made in his likeness. If we have this, we'll die again. See, nobody can say the graves will open, the dead shall walk out. Well, that may be true, but not open the way you say open. That's right, see, he won't be like that. It'll be a secret because he said he would come like a thief in the night. He's already told us this, the rapture, then judgments will strike, sins, plagues, sickness, and everything. The people will cry for death to take him from the judgment. Lord, why is this judgment upon us when you said that there would be a rapture first? And he will say, it's already coming, you didn't know it. God hiding himself in simplicity, oh my, all right, it's already happened, and you knew it not. It's, you know why it's already happened? Because it already has taken place, it's already begun. The ark, there is a shout. Are you in it? Because when the when the voice goes, that's the door closing. Amen. From questions and answers, whenever whenever God's people gets together completely, I believe the resurrection will take place then. There will be a rapture time when the Holy Spirit begins to gather it up together. It will be in the minority, of course, but there will be a great gathering. Let's get ready. Let's get ready for the midnight cry. It's coming in an hour when you think not. There'll be a cry not amongst the unbelieving world. It'll be a secret. Look, God is gathering together his elect. I've seen it personally all around the world. Brothers, look, brothers that wouldn't even fellowship with each other. After we, we went over the relationship between father and son, hugging and crying. And, and then they had a, 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 a citywide event of people were, that had been in their beds for two years, out of their beds, everything else. Brothers that had walked across the street when the other one was coming their way. When they realized, we're brothers, we're family. What are we fussing about? It's happening. Whenever God's people get together completely, I believe the resurrection will take place then. We're going beyond the camp. And you know, we'll be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Think of it, missing people, they can't see you no more. But you're getting together with the rest of the group. They can't see you, but you're getting together with the rest of the group. And the trumpet of God will sound, the dead Christ shall rise first, and appear to many. And all at once, you happen to stand and look, and well, there's a brother, there's a, there's a brother, and you know it ain't long, in a few minutes we'll be changed in the moment to a and I, and together with them, be missing on earth, caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Again, just questions and answers. Now, the first thing happens when we're resurrected. The ones that are living will just still remain. The, the resurrection will set in. First, the resurrection of those that are asleep. There will be awakening time, and those which are asleep in the dust 
will be awakened first, and then these corruptible bodies will put on incorruption in the rapture and grace of the Lord, and then we'll all get together. And when they begin to get together, then we which are alive and remain shall be changed. These mortal bodies will not see death, but just all of a sudden there will be a sweet light go over us, and you're changed. You're, you're turned back like Abraham was from an old man to a young man, from an old woman to a young woman. Uh, what's the sudden change? And after, after a while, you're traveling like a thought. And you can see those then who are already resurrected. If you're traveling like a thought, I'm sorry, what do we need an airplane for? You understand? If he said this is going to happen around the world, where are they going to travel to like a thought? Together, together. Mm -hmm. And after a while, you're traveling like a thought, and you can see those, and, and you can, and you can see those then who are already resurrected. And oh, what an hour! Then we'll gather with them, and then be caught up with them to meet the Lord of the air. Yes, the church will all be together, but after, after the resurrection and the rapture <coughs> has set in, I like that. It puts the whole thing at rest. Don't have to worry about a rusted out thing of buck, a bucket of bolts, right? God got everything in order. And I, you know what? I've always wanted to travel like a thought. Get tired of traveling over to see the brothers over there. It's going to be nice one day. I won't have to do that anymore. Questions and answers. The time of the rapture will be the awakening of the dead and the getting together of the living after the rapture to take place. And Jesus cannot come until a church, a body of believers, and the ministry that he wants it will have to be the same as it was then. And then that brings them without us is not made perfect. Paul said Hebrews 11, without us it cannot be perfected. They must have this ministry to raise up the Lutheran, Wesley, and all of them down through their ages. And just a few more quotes will be closed here. Uh, and then shall he send, uh, for questions and answers again, he says, and then shall he send his angels, gather together and elect from the four winds and the up, and the utmost parts of the earth to the uttermost parts of heaven. That's talking of the resurrection, the translation going up. He will send forth his angels to gather. Did you ever think of what those angels are, huh? Messengers. He will gather them together, congregate them together, see? Bringing them, bind them together from the utmost, uttermost parts of earth to the uttermost parts of heaven. The word that was, that was been made manifest on earth, see, get it? The word's been spoken, here it is manifest. And from rising in the sun, he says, now... And see, now you are already resurrected. When God raised him up, he raised you. The sun is, is just now on you. And now you're growing into a blossom of life like he was. To be resurrected completely in that last day. Your potentials you have now. Why do you know? Your soul changed, didn't it? Your body come into obedience to it, didn't it? How many women used to have short hair? Any of you? Alright. What happened? Your body came into obedience to what? Your confession. That's what he's saying right here. Your soul changed, didn't it? Your body come into obedience, didn't it? it, it into obedience to what? The church? The word, which is the life. Then you are now resurrected from the dead. You potentially have the earnest, the waiting. Now, <coughs> now, when you have the dynamic, when you get the dynamics, you have been quickened from mortal to immortality. It, it makes the whole body come subject to the word. It'll make you act different, look different, live different. It'll just make you different. They notice it is just a little seed laying in the ground. Now, potentially, you are resurrected. You're resurrected when you see the Holy Spirit in, your, in, in you. You're resurrected right then. Your body potentially resurrected. You see, because I have to obey your confession. Uh, just a few more quotes will be that. Questions and answers, 64. Remember, I'm saying to you in the name of a prophet, see, in the name of a prophet, the resurrection and rapture will be general all over the entire world. No matter where you're at, when that hour comes, you'll be caught up to meet him. That's, that's all. There's nothing going to stop you no matter where you are. And then we have to balance that with the other one, where he says that we'll be gathered together and we'll travel like a thought. All right. From questions and answers, it says across the world they won't, they won't be gathered into one place to have things in common, but little groups of them will be scattered all over the earth. I believe maybe in, if the Lord permit, this is a little group of it, maybe another group in Asia, down in Germany, and, some, and down somewhere else. Yes, sir. And from letting off the pressure, can't you see we're at the end time? It's all over. The next thing will be a sweep of getting that little group together. And in a month or so, she'll be gone. As soon as she's gathered together, we're at the end. There's no hope any left anywhere. Run to Christ. So I'm really getting excited. Because one of these days, I'm going to see love books. One of these days, I'll know that we've got about 40 more days. And we're out of here. 
and the world can do whatever it wants. And so Sunday, we're going to look now at this is what's happening in our realm. Now we're going to look Sunday at the realm, and I, I hate to just focus on that, <coughs> but we'll, maybe we'll, we'll throw some other things in about us too, because I want you to understand. We're going to look at the realm of the world. And the things Brother Bram said have to happen because as soon as the resurrection takes place and we're out of here, then everything falls apart. We'll have the plague, we'll have the Great Depression, we'll have all these things take place. Now we've been seeing it happen. We've been seeing it building up, building up, building up. It, when we're gone, it just, the, 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 the whole, what's under the table is something at top and it's over. But you know what? We won't care because we're going to be at a wedding supper for three and a half years. Right. Three and a half years with our loved ones taken out of this pest house. Oh, hallelujah. That's power has some prayer. Gracious Father, we're so, so thankful, Father. Because we have promises, oh God. We've got promises of the token. If we apply the token, you can save our loved ones. We promise, O oh God, that we'll see those that have passed on before us come up. We'll be joined together with them. We'll have a wonderful time, O oh God, for 40 days. And then go to meet your son Jesus, the crowning King of Kings and Lord of Lords. To sit at our wedding supper. What a what a wonderful feast. I guess every one of us here loves to eat, Father, but we love to eat spiritual men. And so, Lord, I don't care what kind of food you're serving. I just know that you're the best chef there ever was. I'm looking forward to eating what you have to prepare. Be with us, Father. Help us, O oh God, to be ready. Help us to be longing and desiring in our hearts, dear Lord, <coughs> for all the promises you have for us in this hour. But we ask it humbly in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing that song, I know whom I have believed. And I persuade that he is me. The key that which I have committed unto him.